Welcome back, everybody, for our final speaker today. Um, following the speaker, we're going to have a brief uh, round table for questions as long as that goes. And at following that, we'll have a reception. So please stick around and um, we'll be hanging out, chatting after this. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, for our last speaker, we have Jason Farman. Uh, Jason is an associate professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. He's also the director of the Design Cultures and Creativity Program and faculty member with the Human Computer Interaction Lab. He is author of the book Mobile Interface Theory, Embodied Space in Locative Media, winner of the 2012 Book of the Year Award from the Association of Internet Researchers. He's the editor of the books The Mobile Story and Foundations of Mobile Media Studies, and his current book, Waiting for Word, will be published in fall of 2018 by Yale University Press. We look forward to that. Um, he has published scholarly articles on such topics as mobile technologies, the history of technology, digital maps and cultural geography, locative and site-specific art, video games, digital storytelling, the whole gamut. Anything digital, Jason's written on it. <laughs> um, I'd like you all to please welcome with me uh, Jason Farman. Thank you so much, and thank you for sticking around uh, for this. My talk today is uh, drawn from my book, um, which began about five years ago when I was at a conference in Boston. A scholar of Japanese popular culture made an offhand remark about an emerging practice among teens in the country. Uh, he said that they're sending blank text messages to each other. So the idea was that if you were in a romantic relationship, you would send your romantic partner a text, no words. It just pops up on their phone as a little blip. And their job as your partner was to send you back a blank text message with as little time elapsed as possible. Uh, so the idea is that you're paying attention enough to notice that your partner has texted you and you text them back immediately. And there are no words, there's no images, there's no video sent. Uh, the content here is time. So this fascinated me. Uh, I've uh, been studying mobile media culture for a while and thinking about how people exchange messages with one another and there's no, there's no content here, the content is time. But the problem with the text messages was that nobody had ever heard of it. I started asking around uh, other uh, experts or people who had lived in Japan and nobody had ever heard of the blank text messages. So mm -hmm. I went to Tokyo and to try to hunt down this story. And I interviewed dozens of college students to find out about their practices. Had, had they sent blank text messages before? And when I brought up the story of the blank text, I was greeted with nothing but blank stares. They had never sent a blank text message in their whole life. I talked to scholars of mobile culture uh, in Japan. Uh, none of them had heard of it. Uh, so. For me, this story of the Japanese blank text messages was really interesting because I began to think about how this has been something we've done throughout history. We've sent messages and we've waited for responses, and the wait times have been meaningful. They've been content in and of themselves. And so now this founding story of my book was, a, was apocryphal. It didn't ever happen. I came back to the United States after my trip to Tokyo, and I was telling my colleague at the University of Maryland about this, um, and he said, well, actually, when I was a teenager in Italy, we did something really similar uh, called ringing. So this was in the days before social media, before Facebook. And it was also in an era when sending a text message cost you per text. Uh, there was no unlimited data plan. So what people would do to circumvent that was to ring each other. So what you would do is you would ring your friend or your romantic partner and your caller ID would show up on their phone, and then you hang up after one ring. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. And it's a way of communicating, I'm thinking about you. And your job as, your, as their friend or romantic partner was to ring them back with as little time elapsed as possible. Uh, so my friend was telling me about this. My colleague at the University of Maryland was telling me about this, and he would get so many rings in a day from his friends, and he had a romantic partner. Many of them went to different high schools, 
So they wouldn't see each other throughout the week. So between classes, they would just send a ring to each other. Uh, and he said, I, I was so burdened down by all of these rings I had to return to people. Uh, and he had this romantic partner, and he'd get rings all the time. And in these moments between sending and receiving a ring, he was reflecting on their relationship. And he said, you know, I'm just not that into you to really <laughs> keep returning these rings all day long to you. So he ended their relationship. Um, so for me, these rings became a moment of reflection. The wait times are really interesting moments of reflection for us to understand our social lives. Uh, and they, both the blank messages in Japan and the Italian rings belong in this long lineage of technologies that have kept us in touch. Uh, in each culture and in every era, we've sent messages and we've waited for a response. We do it now with our emails and our text messages and people throughout history have waited for messages from runners or people riding on horseback delivering messages, letters sealed and stamped, telegraph uh, transmitting across oceans, uh, news reports in the daily edition. And the delay between sending and receiving messages um, is something we've always interpreted. Um, and we've interpreted through anxiety, through hope, fear, boredom, longing. And these interpretive moments are really powerful tools that shape our social lives. Um, and technologies for keeping in touch have actually changed the rhythms of daily life. Um, sending and receiving a message shifts the ways that uh, we are able to bridge distances with one another and also create a, a pace for our social relationships. When we're not near each other, when we're keeping in touch through messages, anticipating those messages, and the speed at which those messages can be delivered actually shapes the human experience of time. So I've gone back through history to understand how technologies for keeping in touch have transformed what it, what it means to experience time and duration um, with a particular focus on waiting. So time itself is an essential component to, the, to our media for keeping in touch with one another. Uh, and so the book that I've uh, been working on, um, which is called uh, Delayed Response, a new title, um, Delayed Response, The Art of Waiting from the Ancient to the Instant World, uh, which will be out this fall in November uh, from Yale University Press and funded through the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, does a bit of an archaeological dig back through media history to understand how these media have shaped our senses of time and, and how that time ultimately shapes who we are. And one example is um, in the second chapter is the pneumatic tube system here in New York City. Um, second chapter looks at how pneumatic tubes, which began in 1897 here in New York all the way through the 1950s, created this notion of instant messaging. You could send messages to each other all day long uh, through the mail system. It'd be delivered in an hour uh, and ran throughout the day and kept people in touch. And, and, and all of a sudden, people had this notion of, just, I can send messages, I can coordinate, I can communicate all day long uh, with uh, the people in my life. Uh, E.B. White wrote about this in his uh, book, Here is New York. Uh, and he wrote that it's a miracle that New York works at all. <laughs> the subterranean system of telephone cables, power lines, steam pipes, gas mains, and sewer pipes is reason enough to abandon the island to the gods and weevils. Every time an incision is made in the pavement, noisy surgeons expose ganglia that are tangled beyond belief. When a young man in Manhattan writes a letter to his girl in Brooklyn, the love message gets blown through to her through a pneumatic tube, just like that. So for White, he brings up a really fantastic point that kind of echoes throughout the book, that it's not just that a, me a love message is being delivered, it's how it's being delivered and the speed at which it's being delivered. Uh, it's a letter through pneumatic mail, uh, and the speed at which it's delivered is an essential part of the message uh, itself. And uh, I work from the mobile era, thinking about how our own lives and our instant messages link with this period of the pneumatic mail uh, in New York City. Uh, I think about the fiber optic age, but it's also that these wait times are not just shaping our social lives, they, it shapes what we know. Wait times are an essential part of knowledge production. I spent time uh, with um, John Ho Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab team that was running the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Uh, and I'm a digital media scholar, and I study the, you know, the instant. You know, I'm studying how people, college students, are communicating instantly to each other throughout the day. And talking with these astrophysicists about their projects, uh, the New Horizons missions was decades in the making. 
uh, took nine years to arrive to Pluto. When it arrived and finished its flyby of Pluto, um, as the spacecraft has continued onto the Kuiper belt, it turned around and beamed its data back to the Earth. It took 16 months for that data to downlink to Earth. So it took like 40 years for these people to get their data, and they're still combing through it. Um, knowledge takes time for us to process. So I've been really interested in people who do longitudinal studies, as well as people like the New Horizons team, to think about how knowledge takes a, requires time. And, and very much in contrast to our own sort of curiosities that we can just look up uh, on Wikipedia. Um, and, and, and the ability for us to have instant knowledge. Uh, instead, we see that waiting can become an essential feature for how knowledge is produced and maintained and then innovated on as well. I've connected this back to uh, Civil War letters and the pace at which letters shaped uh, soldiers' lives and their families' lives and, and the infrastructures through which these letters were delivered. Uh, I've gone back and uh, spent time in the British National Archives looking at medieval seals. How does your body connect across distances? People needed to find a way to authenticate their identities across vast distances, and seals were one way of doing that. Imprinting your own mark onto the document itself as a way of verifying who you were and also communicating your power. Don't delay in responding to me. I am a person of authority. Um, all the way back to the very first messages humans ever sent, which were Aboriginal message sticks, uh, 40 to 55,000 years ago. As people began migrating onto the continent of Australia, uh, they used a very sophisticated means of communicating with one another to share knowledge about the landscape uh, as they would begin uh, moving across it. So all of this fits in with sort of the study of nonverbal communication, um, which we typically think of in terms of gesture, uh, we think of uh, facial expressions, proximity even as a part of nonverbal communication, uh, but time is also uh, a part of that, uh, which Edward T. Hall talks about in his book, The Silent Language. He opens it by saying, time talks. It speaks more plainly than words. The message it conveys comes through loud and clear. Because it is manipulated less consciously, it is subject to less distortion than the spoken language. It can sh uh, shout truth where words lie. So we might think of this as like the pregnant pause is a really good example. You know, if you ask somebody, how do I look today? Good. You know, that, that pause is meaningful. Uh, it, beca it becomes something that you interpret. Uh, comedian and author Jesse Klein talks about this moment where she was getting married. Uh, she decided she was going to get a wedding dress, even though she hated the idea. It went against every grain of feminism in her. She didn't want to be this cookie cutter wedding dress, you know. Uh, so she goes, she tries on a dress, which she said looked a little bit like a slutty saloon owner, uh, which she loved. Uh, she took a picture of it. She's like, this is fantastic. She texts it to her best friend and says, is this the one? And then uh, it's over iMessage. So she sees the little three dots come up that means somebody's typing on the other end. She's waiting. And then the three dots disappear. And then they pop up again. The person's typing. And then they disappear. And then they come up again. She's like, oh, I'm so, no, I'm done with this. I'll send it to all my friends. So she sends it to a bunch of her closest friends. Is this address? And she said, I'm just getting three dotted all over the place. All of these people are hesitating. You can just see the, on the interface that they are typing. And then they're like, oh, how do I put it? This is not the dress for you. Uh, eventually, one of her friends texts back and says, um, that, that's OK. I'm happy to keep shopping with you more. Um, <laughs> she does end up wearing the dress. She, she buys it. Uh, but through the interface, you could see the hesitation, how um, ultimately the, the wait time for a response communicated loud and clear to her that her friends absolutely hated that. Uh, so for the book, I look at waiting as not an in-between time. We think of it as um, this, this gap between moments. But actually, waiting has been this silent force that's been shaping our social interactions and also uh, the ways that we uh, produce knowledge. And it's actually designed into the very fabric of our mobile technologies. Um, uh, I, I did a nationwide study both uh, in the US and in Canada with university students uh, about their mobile use. And by and large, they expect a response to their text messages within five minutes. And this actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it, um, because ultimately, for how we use our mobile devices, just think about how you use your device uh, within a day. If you're 34 years or younger, you are 
opening and unlocking your phone on an average 150 times in a day. And all of us in this room who have a smart device, we are clicking, tapping, and swiping an average of 2,600 times in a day. Uh, so when you send somebody a message and they've got this device on them throughout the day, you expect that they're going to look at it at some point, um, and likely within five minutes. The students that we surveyed um, begin to get worried and concerned. Why hasn't this person responded to me within the hour? Um, so here there are real social expectations about delay, and they communicate very clearly. And we use our mobile devices since 2009 on a global scale more for texting and data exchange with each other than we do for voice communication. So we're actually using our devices in a way that centers waiting. You send a message and you wait for a response. That's how we prefer to use our devices. And it's, it fits in with the uh, social lives of these devices as well, where we don't want to call somebody and interrupt a particular thing. So we decide uh, to uh, center waiting instead, um, which is very odd because we hate waiting. We despise waiting. Uh, waiting becomes a thing that creates anxiety um, about how long we'll be left waiting, especially when there is no feedback or little feedback given about when your waiting uh, will end. Uh, someone who makes another person wait by either being late or forcing them to cool their heels somewhere, uh, it can be seen either, either as a sign of disrespect or to reiterate a particular power dynamic uh, in that relationship. So waiting can make us feel powerless, it can make us feel frustrated, um, and it it's true not only of these large moments of waiting where you have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or even a larger scale, you know, waiting for you to finally finish your dissertation, you know, uh, that kind of long-term thing. It's also found its way into the smaller mundane moments of life where you're waiting in line, uh, where you feel obligated to pull out your phone and occupy your time in some way. Um, so tech companies are seizing on these avoidance techniques for waiting, where we do have this disdain for waiting uh, and to, to find a way for them to utilize that. So waiting in one sense can be a way for us to be drawn to a, to a tech company's product, an app or something along those lines. In a moment of waiting, you want to use your time productively, effectively, so you are often drawn to a particular technology, maybe email or a game, uh, to occupy your time. Waiting can conversely be the thing that pushes you away from the tech company's product. Amazon did an interesting study where they found that on average, if their customers are um, forced to wait a tenth of a second, they would lose 1% of their revenue. So to put this in perspective, a tenth of a second is about the time that it takes for a sensation to go from your nerve ending to your brain. That's how quick it is. So it's, it's, it's beyond the perceptible even, that, that short register of time. But it's effective. It's enough to drive people away, that, to feel that something is wrong. Google was similarly doing a study where they were responding to customer requests for more search results on a page. Right now, if you do a Google search, 10 results come up. And they were experimenting, well, what if we give people 30 search results instead? The results re um, produced a latency of about a half second, which meant for 30 search results, it took about a half second longer for you to get that. And in the group that they were studying this with, there was a 20% drop in traffic because of this half second uh, delay. So waiting here reveals a, a contradiction. It is both an opportunity and the thing that needs to be eliminated. Um, so waiting is a moment of awareness. For, we, we realize we're waiting and we feel obligated to use that time in some kind of way that either helps ease the anxiety of it or uh, to help us feel productive. And then at the same time, it's, a, it's something that needs to be eliminated. It's a bug in the system. So the mythologies of the digital age are centered around the idea that waiting is the antithesis of technological innovation. Uh, in our ever-accelerating culture, waiting runs counter to that. And we're promised sort of the ever-accelerating paces of connectivity as we're trying to connect with people who are not near us, who are not in this room with us. Uh, eventually, that, those, that distance might be bridged by technological um, innovation. So ultimately, our time is calibrated to notions of efficiency that, in a single gesture, both demonize waiting while preying on it as the opportune moment to occupy uh, our attention. So waiting for me is 
this really interesting moment to study. Uh, and, and the book advocates for us to become students of waiting um, and to understand it and to understand how it teaches us about power dynamics, who is forced to wait or who is immune from waiting, uh, cultural notions about productivity and efficiency, why do we hate waiting so much, um, how do we perceive our own time, um, how knowledge is produced and requires time, and then ultimately how these times shape our uh, social lives. And part of this is uh, the book concludes with this idea of tactics of waiting, and I'm drawing on uh, Desertos' contrasting notions of tactics and strategies. Uh, these are military terms. So strategy is when a military force comes in and makes an attack. And in response to that attack, the other side creates a tactic, a strategy. You know, it's, it's a way of dealing with the strategy that has been imposed. So there are tactics to waiting uh, that we can employ that help us study, become students of waiting. And I think the first part of it is as you're waiting, we need to ultimately get past the emotions of waiting. We often feel the... Um, the, the anxiety or the boredom or, or the longing that is associated with waiting, um, and instead shifting them toward a simple question of why am I waiting? This is where I begin. Why am I waiting? And this produces shallow answers that I think are a really good first step in developing tactics for waiting. You might be waiting because your friend is running late. Uh, you might be waiting because a colleague is finishing up a previous meeting. You might be waiting because the train runs only every 20 minutes on the weekend, uh, or you decided to go to a restaurant at peak hours and the kitchen uh, is slammed. The next, the follow-up question that helps with this is that I find really fascinating is to, in that moment, ask yourself, who benefits from me waiting? And it might be you. In one sense, we sometimes benefit from our own waiting. If you think about waiting as a virtue, patience, if we think about the ideas of delayed gratification, I'm going to wait and not eat that one marshmallow for you to come back in the room so I can have the second marshmallow uh, that I benefit from waiting. <clears throat> um, delayed gratification is all, ar all around that. Um, going to grad school is delayed gratification. You benefit from this time where you're anticipating uh, a career. Um, but waiting can also reveal uh, the structural benefits for those in positions of power who are able to reiterate that power by making us wait. There's been really interesting studies of waiting rooms. Uh, one was done in uh, South America looking at welfare offices uh, and how they are designed. They are typically designed with too few seats uh, uh, to accommodate the number of people that are in there. There's also no feedback in the space for when your waiting will end. There's no numbers called. You don't even know if you're actually going to get your government subsidy that day. Uh, so there's very little sense about, as you enter that space, if you're going to get what you came for. And all of this reiterates this power differential between the people who are waiting and the people who are in charge in that space. Uh, and we can see this play out over and over again. Um, as, you know, a, a person might make you wait to simply reiterate their power in that relationship. This is true of romantic relationships as well. As people make other people wait, it, it is, a, is vying for a, a certain level of power in that relationship. Uh, Roland Barthes has a great book, A Lover's Discourse, where he talks about waiting quite a bit, uh, in that uh, he writes, Am I in love? Yes, since I am waiting. Uh, the other never waits. Sometimes I want to play the part of the one who doesn't wait. I try to busy myself elsewhere to arrive late, but I always lose at this game. Whatever I do, I find myself there with nothing to do, punctual, even ahead of time. The lover's fatal identity is precisely I am the one who waits. Uh, so in our most intimate relationships, how we wait reveals uh, some of the power dynamics that are at play in those relationships. And it's worth asking how we make other people wait as well. How do you make people wait in your life uh, as a way of exercising power within uh, that relationship? Out of this, two themes ultimately emerge. Waiting is a way that power is exercised in one way. And then also, one thing that I've um, been drawn to is a shift in thinking that looks at, as, looks at waiting as a collective time rather than an individual time. Um, one of the reasons that waiting is such a burden for us is that we feel that our time is unique from one another. Uh, and when you make me wait, you're stealing my time. I'm, we're, we all are incredibly busy. Uh, we feel very tasked and overburdened with our schedules. And when somebody makes you wait, they're stealing one of the most 
um, rare resources you have, your time. Um, and I saw this play out when I was at a grocery store in my hometown. And it was Sunday morning. The grocery store was packed. Uh, I was third in line. There were three people behind me. The woman who was checking out um, was paying half with credit card, or sorry, half with food stamps, half with cash. She had her toddler in the cart, and she had a bunch of coupons that she was working with the uh, checker to make sure every single coupon was counted. Uh, there was an affluent white woman in front of me who turns around and rolls her eyes, just like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to us. Um, and the manager had to come over uh, because one of the things that was on sale wasn't being counted. And then uh, some of the guys behind me were verbalizing their discontent. Oh my God. And the woman just ignored them and just kept going. Um, and the reason that there was so much frustration in that line was people perceived that this woman was making them wait longer than was socially acceptable on a Sunday morning when the supermarket is totally slammed. Um, so if my time is distinct from your time and you're wasting my time, you're stealing my resource. But if we shift perspectives a bit, uh, we can see our time is intertwined with one another, uh, then we can imagine waiting as an investment in somebody else's social circumstance. Uh, communication scholar uh, Sarah Sharma talks about this. She has a great book called In the Meantime where she looks at the relationship between time and labor. Um, and she argues that the contradictions of the digital age uh, center around this moral imperative of using our time wisely while ultimately critiquing those who have to use their time differently than us because of a structural impediment on them, such as the woman who has to pay half with food stamps, half with cash. Um, so our moral imperative to use our time wisely are ultimately comes out of this very Western notion of using individual time in productive ways. Um, and Sharma argues in her book for a shift of thinking and that if we are temporally aware that the fact that time is not distributed evenly to all of us, uh, then uh, a new moral imperative emerges that my time is bound with yours and it benefits me to see you use your time well or in contrast to help you combat the social structures that force you to spend your time in ways that put you at a disadvantage. Uh, why didn't I have to pay with food stamps and cash? Um, why didn't I have to count every coupon? Um, me waiting can be an investment in your situation to try to understand it and potentially build radical empathy for how people have to deal with time in very different ways. People sometimes have extraordinarily long commute times from their home to where they work uh, two jobs sometimes. Sharma talks about the slow food movement as a really interesting example as well, uh, where you have these people who are deliberately trying to slow down this rapid pace of life um, and gathering around very deliberately prepared uh, plates of food. And what you have often, and so she went and did some observations of slow food movements, often typically with affluent white people. And in the background are all these workers rushing, often people of color working a second job, racing around to clean plates and make sure everything is in place. So her question is, who gets to slow down? Um, how, how is time distributed unevenly? Um, and how can we begin to imagine our wait times as investment in that disparity to begin to understand people's uh, situations differently? So uh, thinking of uh, time as collective rather than individual uh, as an investment in our uh, social fabric. So there are benefits of waiting in, in some ways where we can, you know, benefit from understanding waiting. We can um, benefit from the the investment that we can put into certain things. However, there are times when waiting needs to be combated and fought, where waiting can be a tool of the powerful to maintain the status quo by forcing people to invest their time in ways that inhibit their ability to transform their social situation. Uh, it's hard not to think about Puerto Rico, for example, and the very long time that it's taken for uh, electricity to be uh, restored to the island, or thinking about Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and how slowly recovery efforts were rolled out um, as a way of um, perpetuating social inequality. Wait times can uh, be that. And another tactic that uh, I've been very interested in as well 
is uh, thinking about how wait times can reveal our own hopes uh, for the future and what might come on the other side of waiting. So in the moments of waiting, really analyzing what you hope comes on the other side. Uh, and part of this, I look at buffering icons uh, as uh, this won't turn into anything. It's not actually loading. It's just going to spin uh, right there. Um, I'm really interested in the buffering icon as this piece of software that reveals some of our hopes for what might come on the other side of buffering. And I, I advocate that we're actually half in love with the buffering icon uh, because it's this moment of such great anticipation. Uh, think about Facebook refreshing a feed uh, or a dating app that you might be on and you refresh and this buffering icon comes up, you're like, that is the moment of promise. What might come on the other side of that is somebody finally tweeting, Jason, that was the most amazing talk I've ever heard in my whole life. That's what I wanted to hear, you know? Uh, so thinking about just using that moment of pause as an analytic is really useful, fascinating. Um, and even for my own life, looking at, uh, as I refresh Facebook, I'm constantly asking myself now, what is the future that I hope comes on the other side of this buffering icon? Um, and it's really quite interesting because it rarely happens. You know, you never quite find that thing on the other side. And, and, and it's really useful to understand that and to say, well, maybe Facebook is actually not the place for, for those hopes to, to materialize. Um, so these desires can kind of teach us about our present situation, what we hope for the future, um, and thinking about how to build bridges toward those futures um, and having these moments of pause be really useful moments uh, of reflection. And some people actually advocate that we need to build in these systems uh, for the digital age, that the digital age is predicated on instantaneous connection and, and we're losing waiting and we're losing a lot of the value that comes along with waiting. So we need to build in moments of waiting um, instead. So um, a really famous example here in New York City, Marina Abramovich's uh, Goldberg Variations, um, which was uh, put on here at the Park Avenue Armory 2015-2016 uh, with Igor Levitt, was uh, you, you entered uh, the armory, you were given a key to a locker, you had to put all your stuff, did anybody go to this by the way? In London. Oh, oh in London, okay great. Um, you, we should talk about this, it would be, be interesting to hear your experience. So you, you have to put all your stuff in the locker, no watches, no mobile phones, and you are given a set of noise canceling headphones. And you go and sit in these deck chairs that surround the piano, a gong rings and you put on your headphones and you have to wait in silence for 30 minutes. Nothing happens for 30 minutes. Kind of building on John Cage's uh, 433, sort of this notion that silence is meaningful. Silence uh, is content, uh, which is something that echoes throughout the book. So for Abramovich, she said, you can't come off the streets of New York City into the armory and hear Igor Levitt play these Goldberg variations and understand it. You need this moment of pause. You need the 30 minute wait time to understand how this piece is meaningful. Um, and so a lot of people have been advocating that we need to build in wait times uh, uh, for us to really experience things in, in a way that we're losing, um, but also building in wait times um, for, for our own expectations. Facebook, for example, a couple of years ago launched a security scan of your profile and you could hit it and it would tell you ways that you can make your profile uh, more secure. And nobody was changing their security settings after doing this and Facebook was wondering why. Why aren't people you know, changing their settings? They figured out that the code was so efficient that it spit back recommendations so quickly that people didn't believe it. They're like, that can't be thorough. Um, so I'm not going to change my settings. So what the uh, designers did would go in, they added a line of code that delayed the results uh, for people. So it did the scan, pause, give people the information. And people were like, oh, that was thorough. And they went in and started changing their security settings because we anticipate a certain level of thoroughness that's associated with duration. And that duration wasn't there because the code was so uh, efficient. Uh, so people are imagining ways uh, that we need to build in these wait times to meet expectation, but also capture some of the things that we are losing. There's an app you can download right now where uh, you can take pictures with it, but you don't get those pictures for three days. Uh, and you can't actually see what you're taking a picture of. It's trying to recapture some of that uh, nostalgia of taking your film into the photo lab to get developed and you get them three days later. Uh, what was that experience like? And, and what's the 
the surprise of opening up that envelope with your pictures in it and be like, oh, you know, we're losing uh, some of that with our uh, contemporary mobile photo culture. So people are imagining ways that we might need to introduce wait times uh, within our digital life. Uh, but I think if we can build in some tactics for waiting, tactics that recognize uh, that our time is deeply intertwined with others and our wait times are uh, ways of investing into that, we can become advocates for the value of waiting, that, that waiting becomes this interesting moment of analysis for us to understand social structures, power, even our own relationships, our most intimate relationships, and how we wait in those relationships, um, that uh, we can become students of waiting and, and, and use these times to understand why perhaps we're so busy, why we feel compelled to fill our schedules uh, to the point where we really can't breathe and around the ideas of productivity and efficiency that waiting seems to contrast. Uh, if we embrace waiting, we may be able to uh, begin unpacking that and, and combating some of those expectations around how our time is used. So ultimately unpacking waiting's power and its promise, but also uh, its danger as well and some of the ways that we can learn from it. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I didn't need social media for that. <laughs> Yeah, in, in a couple of senses. So the first one is thinking about uh, the contrast between um, the buffering icon and the percent done progress bar. So feedback becomes really interesting way to let people multitask. Uh, so if you see this, you don't actually know when it's going to end. Um, so you may be able to leave the screen. So let's say this you're, you're waiting for Netflix to finish buffering you're probably not gonna leave the room uh, and come back to, oh, this is gonna take 10 minutes, I'll be right back. Uh, with buffering, we're not quite sure. Uh, percent print done progress bars, on the other hand, which were designed uh, by Brad Myers at uh, Carnegie Mellon, was a way of introducing some feedback about this software is gonna take eight hours to load, you can go multitask. So there's really interesting interface designs that give a certain amount of feedback that allow for multitasking. And that was sort of the joy of these percent done progress bars. Like people know, oh, this is gonna be slow. I can now jump over to a different thing. I have an expectation for how long something's gonna take, so now I can do something else. Rather than simply waiting for this thing to load, I don't know how long it's going to load. Um, but all of this centers around notions of productivity. Uh, I think we're drawn to, product, to multitasking because it gives us the illusion of productivity where we don't have to wait, or we are eliminating wait times. We let it fall into the background, and now I can do this other thing. So I don't have to just sit here while this thing spins until it loads. I can go do other things and fill my time. Um, so multitasking becomes this way of us feeling like we are using our time wisely and, producti and productively. Um, which again sort of reiterates this notion that wait times are wasted times. And I think throughout the book I'm kind of combating that. Uh, so multitasking as a way of eliminating waiting as opposed to um, using it as a moment of analysis. I feel like I've got a, question, so a similar question, but slightly different. That is, um, in a lot of design work on my own and others, I'm seeing wait, that the wait times is becoming an opportune time for design. Mm -hmm. The best example of this that comes to mind is um, multi-hour lines at Harry Potter World yeah. that force you to it, settle into the environment. Right. It's yes. very yep. well constructed. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess the, one of the questions I've got with that, or a quick other reference is like with Sifter, like our whole goal is like we know you're waiting for the bus for a couple minutes a day, so yes. we're yeah. going to try to develop a thing that makes that time more rich. Yep. So I guess my question with that, it, relating to multitasking, is saying like if designers are using that as an opportune time, what dangers exist in that, and what mm -hmm. maybe, what, what would you say to these designers? Yeah, yeah. So I, the I have a whole chapter on designs of waiting. Um, 
it talks about the Imagineers at Disney uh, developing the lines. Uh, so in one sense, you end, I mean, using, it, again, Disney as, as an example, as you enter a ride, Haunted Mansion, wait time, 45 minutes. They almost always overestimate that time because if it only lasts 35 minutes, you feel like you won. Ah, oh, I beat the time, you know, rather than, oh my God, I just waited 45 minutes for a two minute ride, you know. Um, so by setting expectation for how your time will be used and then beating that expectation, designers are often, uh, you know, manipulating the, our uh, expectations around duration to produce meaning, you know, a, a happy experience rather than a dreadful one. And then designing these experiences that occupy your attention while you're um, in that line as well. And in terms of how that then mirrors into everyday life, into these dead moments of the day where you're trying to occupy uh, yourself, um, I think the dangers of that are that um, in one sense, we are dampening the creative capacity that comes with things like daydreaming, uh, with things like boredom. Uh, we're trying to eliminate boredom. Uh, by occupying ourselves. We've, we often feel, especially my undergraduates, feel that boredom is one of the worst feelings you can have and you really need to avoid it. Um, neurologically, uh, something kicks in called the default network when you're bored and daydreaming. And the default network allows you a mode of creative thinking that is inaccessible otherwise. Uh, so in terms of the creative capacity that comes with waiting from not pulling out your phone at the bus stop, uh, but for simply letting yourself be bored and stare off into space um, unleashes the ability to be creative in ways that you can't access otherwise. And I think we're losing that, especially around the compulsion. You know, I'm an advocate for mobile media. I, I design for mobile. Uh, I write about it. I theorize it. I, I love mobile technology. Um, but I realize the compulsion that comes with wanting to pull out my phone during those dead times. It's it's some it's becomes habitual to a point where I don't let myself get bored. Um, so, and and there are, there's not a technological way to reproduce boredom. You know, uh, you, you can't build an app uh, to just sort of, I, I guess you could, but it yeah, kind of default, careful. you know, doing, yeah. doing nothing is the point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see if we can do that. Um, so, so I think we're kind of losing some of these creative capacities for boredom. Um, a great book that just came out is Manoush Samarodi, um, Boredom Brilliant, uh, that ex explores uh, some of this, uh, sort of the creative capacities of, of boredom. And it goes back to Siegfried Krakauer has a great article called Boredom. Uh, where he said basically the most boring people are the ones who don't want to be bored. Um, and, and yeah, I think with, in mobile culture, we're uh, trying to eliminate waiting and boredom, and, and I think there, that comes with great cost. Jason, I was mostly serious about one of the best talks. <laughs> I was so happy that you mentioned Edward T. Hall, because uh, his two of his books were so like, Design Bibles when I was in architectural school. Nice, yeah. The Silent Language. Yep. And the Hidden Dimension. Yep. And I've used the things I learned from that in all my design work. And the idea of waiting, some of my best times is waiting online because inevitably you find somebody interesting to talk to. Yeah. And something happens. Yep. So waiting online for anything is part of the experience for yep. me. Yep. And you know, I, I don't think designers have read his work enough. Right. That's why I'm so happy to see yeah. that you, you know, it's brilliant stuff it is, because yeah. he's a, he, he combines the, the cultural differences that affect the world. Yep. And you know, so I, I would recommend those two books. They're out of print, it's very hard to find them. Hmm. Yeah, his his work definitely has impacted even my notions of you know. It started with proximity and proxemics, and and uh, which relates so much to what we're talking about today. You know what it means to be near to somebody culturally or far, and uh, and, and all the way through his work on time um, and and chronemics uh, definitely was a starting point for me uh, for this work. The one I use the most is the difference between the Japanese approach to design and the Western yeah. approach to design. And because of the structures of Japanese homes, the walls are paper thin. So it's 
So they're not concerned about uh, noise. Right. They're concerned about visual. Mm -hmm. And in Westmans, you see an office with a, a conference room that's glassed in. They're concerned about hearing. So when these two cultures come together, also the tatami mat, you know? A room is so many tatami mats wide, you know? The furniture's all in the center. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the periphery. When Japanese people come <coughs> here, they say, there's no furniture in the room, because it's not where they're expecting to see it. Same thing with uh, Westerners who go to uh, Japanese homes. They don't see any furniture, because it's not where they expect it. And, and unless you know that, you get into possibly conflicts. You know. so yeah, thanks. Yeah. Shannon, do you? Do you have time? Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, we have like this panel time, but we okay. can we can all like gather around and okay. talk too. <laughs> Go ahead. This may be kind of a partly self-centered or selfish question for those of us on the panel, but I'm wondering, given that um, there's concern about these, uh, ex there was a book that came out, building on your comment about slow food called The Slow Professor. It yes, came out yep. a couple years yep. ago. I'm wondering if you have addressed in the book, or I'm sure you have thought about your own kind of personal mm -hmm. labor about how new communication technologies, because I imagine some of us are old enough to remember the days when professors had office hours once a week. Yeah. You had to you had to wait for their attention essentially. Yep. And right. now there's a, a connection between expedited communication, yep. the corporatization, neoliberalization yep. of the university. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that's something you is either in the book or you could just right. say yeah. a few words about it. And I just nod to like the the uh, <laughs> slow scholarship <laughs> kind of movement. Um, there's 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 a whole host of slow movements that mm -hmm. have emerged this a slow church. Uh, that's emerged. Uh, so slowness has kind of found its way back. And I get the impetus behind that. And I think as a professor as well, um, not only, you know, around the idea that we are being forced to publish at paces uh, that are often sort of the antithesis of, of, you know, sitting with an idea and what might actually develop uh, from that idea over time. Um, uh, but also, yeah, around around these notions of uh, efficiency and and sort of in contrast to notions of like professors being dead wood, you know, because they're not productive, right? Um, so I think a lot of this, yeah, has emerged around the technological moment and era we're in, not only with the paces that it's created, but with the expectations of of how you use your time well, uh, how you're expected to use your time, how you're supposed to be now on the clock. Uh, all the time. One of my graduate students, uh, his, his partner was in, is in the tech industry and uh, his partner would get text messages all throughout the night uh, and he'd have to get up and go respond to a text or respond to an email at 4 a.m. and he would say to his partner, why are, you, why are you getting up? And his partner would say, I have to. This is the expectation for the job. You know, I have to be on at all times. Now I'm reachable, so the technology has made me reachable at all times, so now the expectation is that I use all of that time. Uh, so um, Jonathan Crary's book, 24-7, uh, looks at sort of the commodification of even this moment of sleep, where, you know, sleep becomes a part of the capitalist uh, experience, you know, can be commodified. Um, so what's interesting for me, this book emerged because I waited um, so long that I changed topics. Uh, so it's, it started as a, as a, as a, uh, <coughs> it, it was originally called the myth of the disconnected life. And it was about sort of, it was in contrast to, to Turkle. And actually Meryl did just a great job. She did a better job in those couple of minutes talking about Turkle than I was planning on doing in the whole book. And I got really bored writing that book. Um, cause I couldn't figure out what I wanted to say. Uh, so I had a, a chapter and a half written, and I was working with a press on it, and they were interested in it. And they're like, yeah, send us another chapter. We'd love to see. And I couldn't write that second chapter. I was so bored with it. So I waited, and I just kind of like thought about it. And eventually it turned into this book, because as I sat with the topic, this, this to me, more interesting topic emerged uh, that I was passionate about. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't given it the time necessary. So the slow scholarship movement makes sense to me. Um, but again, it, it really depends on, it. I've got tenure. You know, I can wait on this book, um, and some people can't. Uh, some people have to write their book, have to get those articles, have to teach that 4-4 load in order to get tenure. Um, and within the structure, we're seeing a very different dynamic about the expectations. So the slow scholarship movement addresses particular people more than others, uh, as I think time, uh, it does, as it 
as it gets distributed, we get to see that tenured professor gets to kind of sit on the idea for a couple of years until it becomes something and others don't. All right. Thank you.